The Lord be with you. Pastor Hermoic here, Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church, Columbus, Ohio. This is going to be the first video in the Adult Catechesis series. The topic is going to be prolegomena and the biblical canon. Prolegomena, million dollar word, we'll talk about in a second. Biblical canon, what is contained in the Bible. We're going to talk about all 66 books in brief. We should get this done in one video. If you don't have the handout, make sure you email me for a copy of it. I'll send you a PDF so you can follow along. We're going to go line for line. I'll just fill in a few blanks uh, because I try to keep it all on one page, both sides, fold in book form, just because I'm a nerd and I like things to be tidy and nice and neat. I'll expand a little bit more on it. Let's just jump right into it, though, okay? So prolegomena, I already said it's a million-dollar word. It's a word seminary students learn in their first semester uh, at the seminary. It simply comes from a Greek word, legomena, meaning sayings or saying something, and prof being a prefix meaning before. So before you say anything about a topic, you got to lay the ground rules. you got to have the fundamentals. Think of it about in terms of basketball. If I were to teach you how to play basketball, I'm not going to start with, hey, we're going to teach you how to run an offense. No, I'm going to start with, here's how to dribble the ball. Here's how to pass it. Here's how to shoot. Remember the little beef acronym? I don't know, if you play basketball, you know. What is it? Balance, eyes, elbows, follow through, uh, whatever. I don't even remember. doesn't matter. Basic fundamentals. That's prolegomena. We've got to have our premises about where we need to be in, in, in our state of mind as we approach reading God's word. Okay? So prolegomena, a million dollar word. <clears throat> now the half a million dollar word, because this isn't as cool of a word as prolegomena, so you learned something already, because I know you probably didn't know what the word prolegomena meant. We have the word hermeneutics. Okay? Hermeneutics is simply the art of interpretation. We're particularly interested in this video in biblical hermeneutics. So here's some fundamentals, basic reading principles about reading the Bible. Okay? So first thing, you got to understand, Jesus is the key to unlocking the meaning of the Bible. Jesus says this for himself in John 5, 39. He says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they, the scriptures, are that which testify of me. So the scriptures testify about Christ. That means Christ is the fulfillment of them all. So no matter what you are reading in the Bible, it's some, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, specifically in the case of the Old Testament, it has its fulfillment in the person of Jesus, or in the work of Jesus, or in the means of grace that he gives to his church into perpetuity to receive for the forgiveness of sins. We'll talk more about that later on. I'm getting a little jargon heavy here. This is first class. I want to keep it simple. Okay. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures. He's the key to unlocking them. This means, very important here, this means that if you are an atheist, you will never come to a proper conclusion of what the Bible means. Because remember the purpose of the Bible, okay? We're going to talk about this in just a minute when we talk about, well, actually, we'll just talk about now. In John, he says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus, that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, so again, if you do not believe that Christ has risen from the dead, that he is the first fruit of the resurrection, you will never fully and properly understand the Bible. This is not to say that an atheist or a Muslim or a Jew or, or so, someone like that could not look at the Bible and have, with their own bias, draw conclusions literarily. Okay, I'm not saying that. Obviously, they can do that. I'm talking about the true spiritual sense of what the scriptures are teaching, that Christ is the Son of God, and that he is the fulfillment of these Old Testament scriptures. Faith is required to see that in its full. Okay, first principle right there. Next, the scriptures are inerrant. That means they are without error. And we get this from John 10.35. Jesus says, the scripture cannot be broken. Broken can also mean loosed. Okay, so if you got, you know, your shoes, you got them all tied up. You're not going to roll your ankle. I mean, obviously there's exceptions to this. But <clears throat> when you got your shoelaces tied nice and tight, you're not going to trip over your laces. You got them. They're good to go. If they're loose, that's when things get wobbly. The scriptures can never be loosed. They can never be loosened like a shoestring. They're tight. They're bound. They say what they say. And the next part here is that the scripture is the truth. Okay, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14. But in his hype, no. Yeah, no. John 14? I think it's John 14. John 10 or John 14? I'm drawing a blank. Whatever. You can look it up. Google it. If wherever I'm wrong. John 14, 6. I'm pretty sure I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Jesus also says in his high priestly prayer, in John 17, 17, when he's praying to the, his Father, he says, Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. So if Jesus says that the word of God is truth, then we should trust that it's true, okay? So the Bible's without error, the Bible is the truth. It is objectively the truth, okay? It means, in other words, I don't make it truth because I believe it. It's, it's true whether I believe it or not. That's what I mean by objective. All right, next thing. Uh, the scriptures are inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God or God breathed, inspired by God, depending on your translation. We trust that there is a unity of the scriptures and that the Holy Spirit, holy men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's either First or Second Peter. I'm drawing like 121. Second Peter 121 or First Peter 121? One of the two. I think it's Second Peter. You can look that one up too and call me out on it. Uh, either way, we trust that the word of God has been breathed out by him. Verbal inspiration, every word and every verb is inspired by God. In their original, in the original documents that were written down, that, that's, what, that's the basic fundamental hermeneutic principle that a Christian starts with. Okay? Lastly, <clears throat> or actually we have two more. We have this understanding of scripture interprets scripture. So we understand what is clear in scripture as is, and we understand what is unclear in Scripture in light of what is clear. So if something is unclear or obscure, well, the best thing, the best solution is to look elsewhere in Scripture to say, well, how would we interpret this in light of what is clearly under, a clear example? Okay, so we do this all the time. This is nothing uh, that's just specific for the Bible, this principle. We would do this with anything else. If, uh, if, if your friend said something, you thought, wait a second, what did you mean by that? Well, first of all, one of the first things you do is say, well, I know his character, and I know what he said elsewhere before about something like this, so I'm going to put the best construction on here and say this is probably what he means. See, so we, we always do this in, in life, where we understand the unclear in light of what is clear. Okay, so that's kind of all under the Scripture interpret Scripture principle. Lastly, we're going to have a whole other video on this. There's always this maintenance, uh, this maintaining of the distinction between law and gospel. So think of law as what God tells us to do. Think of gospel of what God is doing for us. We always make this distinction because the arrows are always going different ways. The law is always what we do either up for God or we do for our neighbor. It's always outward. It's from us to somebody else. Gospel is always arrowed from God to us as individuals. So that means that we can't merit the gospel, we can't earn the gospel, it's from God's grace, okay? So when we're reading something in the Bible and it's telling us to do something, that's law. If it's telling us about something God has done, that's gospel. We must maintain this distinction uh, when we're reading the Bible. So all these things go into our understanding and reading of God's holy word. It's inerrant, it's the truth, and Here's where uh, this first premise of interpretation comes in when we're reading scripture, okay? So we've got, we've got these basic hermeneutical principles, and now we have this most important premise, okay? And the question is, who is the teacher, the magister, and who will be the servant, the minister, okay? So, is our reason going to be the teacher, or is our reason going to be the student? Is the word of God going to be the teacher? Or is the word of God going to be the student? So what I mean by this is, <clears throat> okay, so my reason tells me, I don't know, I'll just make something up, that there's no way this entire universe could have been created in six days. That's what reason tells me, okay? I'm just giving you an example. That's, this is what my reason tells me too. This is just too profound. Well, the word of God says it happened in six days. This is in the book of Genesis. So who's the teacher? The word of God, which is the truth. Jesus has told us it is the truth. Or is my reason the teacher. So reason, we as Christians say, our reason submits to what the scriptures say. Because God's word is true. I am not. I err. I make mistakes. God doesn't. He's perfect. He's without sin. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. That's uh, in the pastoral epistles, First or Second Timothy. Okay, <clears throat> so what about experience? Okay, so let me give you an example here. What about feelings? Let's, let's tie those both, both in together. So experience tells me something, something, you name it. But that's contrary to what God's word says. Well, which one's the teacher, which one's the student? Again, experience must be the student. The scriptures must be the teacher. So my experience, I say, well, I've only been on this earth for 37, 38, 39 years, however old I'm gonna be at the time when you're watching this video, who knows? I'm 37 now. So my reason, or my experience says, 37 years worth of data. Well, guess what, God's eternal. God's word is true. So my experience, I have to have the humility to acknowledge I may not have enough experience. I don't, ha well, I don't have the experience compared to God who has given us his truth revealed to us in the 66 books of the Bible. 
Okay. Third one, feelings. Okay. Well, my feelings tell me <clears throat> I look at someone who's who's having a, a, a sexual relationship that contradicts what God's word says. But they seem happy and they're really nice. Well, my feelings tell me something's got to be wrong in the Bible if it tells me that the Bible says that this is contrary to what they're doing. Again, are my feelings the teacher or is God's word the teacher? My feelings always must be the student. So whether it's reason, experience, or my feelings, those are the student. God's word always must remain the teacher. Now this requires you and I to have humility and acknowledge that we don't have it all figured out. To acknowledge that we are the clay, God's the potter. Okay? So... Most important premises right there. Before we get to the Bible, that's what we're going to, we got to know those things, okay? So 10 minutes in, <clears throat> let's go to uh, how do we get the Bible that we have today? What people always ask about this. Here's just a quick synopsis or, or summary of, of history. Um, a need for a biblical canon arose because of heresy. Heresy is false doctrine. The example I have on your handout is Montanism. Montanism was essentially a, a religious cult, a religious sect that claimed the name of being Christian. What they said was that God continues to uh, uh, reveal His will uh, through modern-day prophets, you know, and this is going to happen, you know, throughout time until Christ comes again. So instead of having the Bible being a closed book. Uh, that we shouldn't add or take away, as, as the end of the book of Revelation says, that we shouldn't add to it or take away from it. Uh, the Montanists said that God will continue to reveal um, his, his will through through prophets throughout throughout time. And by the way, as a pastor, I will once in a while get letters in the mail of people claiming to be these modern-day prophets whom God has given them his will and revealed you know this, this secret knowledge that none of us have had. Um, I will say that in, in 1 Corinthians it says prophets are subject to prophets. I'm, what I'm not saying is, is God can't speak outside of his word or externally from his word. I'm not saying God can't do that. God is God. He can do what he wants. Okay. But what I am saying is, is if someone does claim to have a revelation from God since the Bible has been written, it is subject to what the prophets have said in the 66 canonical books. So if anything that some modern-day prophet claims, if it goes against anything that the Bible says, you can immediately dismiss them as a false prophet. Okay? So anyways, back to why the biblical canon arose. Uh, the early Christian church realized that they needed to have something that's solidified. <clears throat> so this is a practical problem because people, again, were claiming, well, God told me this. Well, God told me this. Well, how do we know who's got it right? So the Bible, so it's not that the canon that they decide, okay, we need to have 66 books. Let's find 66 books to fill in. Or, hey, let's see, let's see what we got. And let's, no, it was, these, these books were already to have been distributed in since the first century, uh, since, you know, shortly after Christ ascended into heaven. Um, these things were written. Uh, the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, we'll talk more about this later. They were written, the pastor, or the, the, the Paul's letters written pretty early. We, the church had them in existence. It just took a while to replicate uh, and, and to duplicate, to have, have scribes, you know, make copies of them. They didn't have printing press until, you know, Luther's time in the 16th century. Okay, so, uh, heresy, or canon versus rise because of heresy. Next, we have this witness of the Muratorian canon, late 2nd century. Um, interesting, this is our first uh, recording um, of, of just about the biblical books that we have today. Interesting omissions, the book of Hebrews, also 1st and 2nd Peter, James, and 3rd John. Now, this canon rejects the Gnostic Gospels. We'll talk more about Gnosticism in our next class on church history. So just hang tight on that. So Gnostics were a heretical group, a lot like the Montanists that we already just, uh, or Montanism, as we just talked about. Um, also, it rejects Marcion's canon. Uh, Marcion was a heretic early on, and he pretty much had 11 books in the, in, of his Bible. He was actually the first one to, to canonize anything. But what he does, he basically has 10 letters of Paul. And even then, those 10 letters of Paul were abbreviated. Parts that he didn't like, he just took out. And then he had an abbreviated version of Luke. Really interesting. Complete rejection of the Old Testament and pretty much rejection of the Gospels, except for an abbreviated portion of Luke. Anyways, this Mars, uh, this uh, this um, Muratorian canon uh, outrightly rejects Gnostic Gospels and also uh, this this uh, Marcion's canon that was you know early on. Okay, last point um, that I just want to make: we our first documented list of all the biblical books that we have in our Bibles today uh, isn't until 367 A.D. with an Easter letter written from Saint Athanasius, one of our uh, faithful church fathers who who defended the doctrine of the Trinity. We'll talk more about that in the next video. Um, again, this is the first official document. Now, some people freak out and say 367. That's, you know, 330 years uh, since Christ had ascended to heaven. That's a long time. Well, again, 
these things don't happen overnight. It wasn't like God said, here is the Bible, and just hands it off to the church and says, here, you know, here you go for us. No, that's not how it works. Remember, these are eyewitness accounts, specifically with the Gospels. This is Paul writing letters to the churches. It takes time for these things to be circulated. It takes time for these things to just become formalized. Um, it's not like our world today where things are literally at the click of a button, right? Okay, we spent 15 minutes talking already. We got to get to the biblical canon now. If you got any questions, feel free to contact me. First thing, Old Testament, uh, there's two Testaments, okay? We've got the Old Testament and we've got the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books and is written in mostly Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. Interestingly, the parts that are written in Aramaic are when the people of God have been exiled. So they're out of the promised land and they're in exile, so they're speaking the language, Aramaic, of the people um, with whom they're residing. Inter just interesting sort of fact. shows that the Bible is, uh, is, is, is a living document. It's not just... Um, God is up in heaven and he just hands people, you know, his word. There's also a human element too. Still without error, right? Still inspired by God, but there is a human, there's incarnational element too, that humans are still writing these things down under uh, the authority and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so New Testament, we're going to talk about later. 27 books written in Greek. Let's jump into it, the word Genesis. I'm just going to basically read what it says here. Genesis, the word itself means beginning. Um, it's both the beginning of time, it's also the beginning of our Bible. Exodus, uh, it's refer, it's it meaning is the exit, and uh, this is the exit of the Israelites uh, from Egypt to the Promised Land. The book of Leviticus is the priestly, the priestly code, including ceremonial and civil laws. This is one of the books that are by far least understood amongst us today, predominantly because we don't live in a world of a sacrificial system. Uh, we also have this uh, a, a total, we, we've just thrown out the, the, the concept of things being holy and clean for the most part. Leviticus talks about this. I'm not going to get into that now. Maybe that'll be a study for another time. <clears throat> but um, again, Leviticus, you have to understand that the, the function of holiness and unholy, clean and unclean, in order to really grasp the book of Leviticus. Important thing though, in Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, um, you should check that out if you're, that's probably... The most Christ-centered uh, story, because there's a th this idea of the scapegoat, where the sins are put on the goat and sent out in the wilderness to die. Well, what happens to Jesus? The sins are put on him. Actually, at his baptism, remember, he's baptized for our sins, and then he's sent into the wilderness, if you start reading your Bible in the New Testament. Uh, so anyways, check out the Day of Atonement. Good stuff there. But again, I'm, I'm, this is an introductory thing. I don't want to confuse you, so I want to stick to the script here. This is me. I tend to, to digress. Book of Numbers. Well, why is it named? Because it begins with a census of God's people. It also details the Israelites wandering the wilderness. So remember, we got Genesis, kind of the patriarchs. He talks about Adam, Eve, Abraham, introduces, uh, well, we got Isaac, we got Jacob, introduces uh, Joseph, and, um, and then we got Moses uh, later on. Uh, and, and, well, Moses is the one who's going to lead the people out of Egypt. And then once they're out of Egypt, they're in the promised land, that's, that's numbers for you. Okay, so you want to read about the history of the people in the wilderness, wandering for 40 years, numbers is a good place to go. Deuteronomy. <clears throat> uh, this comes from the Greek word deutero, which means second, and nomos, which means law. Nomi is short for nomos. So it's the second giving of the law, essentially. Um, an example of this is in Exodus 20, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Well, then it's also the Ten Commandments are repeated in <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 5. So a lot of Deuteronomy repeats the law that God has given throughout the other four books. And those first five books of the Old Testament are also known as the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five. <coughs> so if you ever hear a reference to the Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament. All right, let's talk about Joshua now, okay? So Moses is not allowed to enter the Promised Land. You can read more about that in the Pentateuch. Uh, so the leader who comes after Moses is Joshua. He's the one who enters the promised land. Uh, he's, again, Moses' successor. Um, if you want to read a lot about war, Joshua is <coughs> one of those places to go. Um, good story. Good stories there. Fun, fun history. Uh, especially boys love reading Joshua. Judges, essentially the same thing. A uh, lot of war stories. You got Gideon in, in, in Judges. Um, you got uh, here the Judges before Israel had kings. 
well, they had, had to have someone who was, who was making judicial system. These were the judges, okay? So you kind of see the historical progress of, of the people of God um, moving through history. So judges here, I'll just read it. Before Israel had kings, the, ruler of his, the rulers of Israel were judges. Then we've got Ruth placed after judges. It's a story of God's grace given unto Gentiles and women. Uh, next, we have First and Second Samuel. This is a transition period from judgeship to kings to kingship. I know it's kind of an awkward way. I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep it simple. Um, but First and Second Samuel, Samuel is a prophet. Um, he's essentially you know the last judge, and, and and the people want a king, and so God calls Samuel and says, "All right, I want you to go anoint a king." And uh, so again, it's a transition period to the kings. If you remember who your first king is in, in ancient uh, Israel, it's Saul. After Saul, we've got David. After David, we got Solomon. Those are kind of the first, first three kings, uh, the first three big names. All right. So we're already talking about the kings. Next two books of the Bible: First and Second Kings. Just to read what I have here: the stories of the rise and fall of Israel as a kingdom. First and Second Chronicles, more or less the same stories told in First and Second Kings, but in some cases from a slightly different perspective. Um, and that's a fun thing to, to to read. Now, this doesn't mean that there's a contradiction. Remember, there are no contradictions in the Bible. There are only distinctions. We'll hear more about that in our Law of Gospel uh, class. But in the meantime, it's fun when you see stories told from two different perspectives. And it's, it would, it's the exact same thing from experience today. If, if you and I both witnessed a car accident, and let's say you were on one side of the road and I was on the other, we would tell the story differently. This is just a fact. We would never tell the story the exact same way. Different perspectives, okay? There's a human side of of, of of uh, th it's and and you and I wouldn't be wouldn't be lying either. We would just have a different perspective. All right. Next, we've got Ezra. Uh, this is Ezra was the first priest who was also called a scribe in the Bible. Uh, Ezra talks about the rebuilding of the temple after exile. So the king's period ends with the people going in exile because they've been unfaithful. Uh, they reject God, so God rejects the people, removes them from the promised land. In fact, when he removes them, it's because the land uh, needed to be cleansed of their sin for, for quite a period of time. So Ezra picks up um, with the rebuilding of the temple after the exile is over. The temple is destroyed, people are coming back, good stuff. Uh, Nehemiah, a faithful layman, uh, worship life resumes in Israel. That's what Nehemiah is about. Esther, here's another uh, woman of the Bible. God working through a queen to save his chosen people. That's what Esther is about. Job, first book of wisdom literature. A theme, a summary of theme, God's grace amid horrible circumstances. So if you're suffering, go read Job. Job is a wonderful book. And it takes a long time for Job to figure out that God is, remains gracious even in the midst of suffering. Uh, one of our famous verses, Job 19.25, where Job says, I know my Redeemer lives. We hear it every year on Easter. It's the Old Testament on Easter, on, on, the, day of resurrection, on the day of resurrection. And uh, it's just one of those wonderful uh, gospel promises. We have an Easter hymn with that same exact name. That As Jesus lives, so also we will live. Um, even if we die in this life, we have eternal life in heaven that is to come. So even though Job lost all of his children, he believed in the resurrection. that He would see them again in the resurrection. All right, next uh, we have the book of Psalms. Psalms, psalmus is simply the Greek word meaning song. Now here's where I should point out that you might say, if you remember early on, I said the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, but Psalms is a Greek word. Most of our English names of the Bible, so the names of the Bible that we as English speakers refer to them as, come from the Greek names of the Bible. So uh, around 2nd century B.C., the Old Testament Hebrew and Aramaic is translated into Greek. That is known as the Septuagint. All the names, most of the names, of the Greek words for these books, we've adopted into English. Psalms is one of the examples. Genesis is an example. Exodus is an example. Deuteronomy, I already said, we already talked about, it means the Greek word, second giving of the law. Again, just, just from that ex examples alone, you can see that I'm not lying to you. All right, so Psalms meaning song. It's a collection of 150 songs sung in temple worship, uh, Israel worship. So this is why the Jews knew the Psalms, because they were singing them all the time. It's just like how you and I know hymns. We sing them all the time. For whatever reason, the way God created us, we remember things better when they are put to music. If you try to memorize something written down, it's going to take you a lot longer than if you were to try to memorize a song you heard on the radio. Proverbs. 
uh, wisdom saying. So the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Obviously, you know what a proverb is. It's a wise saying. So Proverbs is wisdom sayings uh, written by Solomon to bestow his wisdom onto his sons. As Christians, we are all sons of Solomon by extension. Ecclesiastes. Uh, the Hebrew title is Koheleth. So remember, we were already talking about this. So Ecclesiastes, of course, again, once again, Greek name for the book. Um, but anyways, the Hebrew title is significant here because Koheleth is one who speaks publicly in a congregation. So Ecclesiastes comes from the Greek word ekklesia, meaning assembly. Ecclesiastes also wisdom sayings. Just interesting there that it kind of has this churchly name and therefore churchly application. All right, Song of Solomon. I hope I'm still... Yes, yep, yep, sorry. Uh, my handout here is out of order. Uh, Song of Solomon. Uh, these are love poems between a husband and a wife. Uh, that reflect God's love for his church. So check out Ephesians chapter 5. This is kind of the, the, the marriage chapter of the Bible. Song of Solomon, um, our, our Western culture, uh, piety, uh, sometimes gets a little uncomfortable with a book like Song of Solomon because it talks about anatomy. Well, it's the, it's the love story, love songs between a husband and a wife. It is totally appropriate, of course, because marriage is God-pleasing. God institutes it back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. But anyways, again, Song of Solomon. Again, it's a love, a love poem, love songs. All right, now we're going to get to the prophets here, okay? Isaiah. He's the first of the major prophets. Isaiah, theologians, will often call Isaiah the fifth gospel. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but there's four gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Isaiah is so significant that it's often called the fifth gospel because it's the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. Isaiah, um, he's got several important things. He talks about the virgin shall conceive um, as a reference to Mary conceiving uh, Jesus by the Holy Spirit. The virgin Mary, the virgin shall conceive. I don't know if I mentioned that, so I've got to make that point. That's significant. Um, I, Isaiah also has, a, we have texts in during our Advent season that come from Isaiah. Comfort, comfort ye my people. This is a command to comfort the people with what? The promise of, hey, I'm sending my Messiah into the world. This is why it's a beautiful Advent theme. So again, Isaiah bringing comfort to God's people with the good news of Zion's redemption. Uh, to get a little historical for a second, for a second when you read the prophets, there are, they will often mention the kings that are, that are leading Israel at that time. <clears throat> so you can go back to the kings. So it's really, it would be a really fun study to read the prophets simultaneously with the kings and chronicles to kind of see what's happening. So Because the prophets are giving prophecies from God. The kings are giving the historical narratives of what's happening during the kings' lives. So in Isaiah's life, you've got, in part of Isaiah's life, you've got Hezekiah, who's the king. And Hezekiah, when Hezekiah is king, it's the smallest kingdom. It's literally just the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah is helpless. And when you are most helpless, who are you most likely to look to? The one who can help God. Okay, awesome stuff. This is why Isaiah is so beautiful and wonderful. Because it's a reminder to us as Christians that no matter what may befall us in this life, no matter how bad things may seem to be, God is still our helper. And we need to look to him for deliverance. All right, next book, Jeremiah. Jeremiah's nickname is the Weeping Prophet. Why is he called this? Because he is constantly lamenting over Judah um, in the midst of exile. Because he's lamenting that the people just will not repent. They just won't repent. And so as any pastor would do, they lament over that. That's why he's the Weeping Prophet. So Isaiah is kind of full of hope in God's promise. Well, Jeremiah is that way too. It's just different historical context, different, different situation. Next, Lamentations, written by Jeremiah, as the name implies. It's a lament, once again, of Judah's unfaithfulness amid exile. And yet, and there's this wonderful thing. So if you were to read Lamentations, right in the very middle of the book. So this is how oftentimes uh, ancient languages worked. Um, so for us, we kind of, when we write a story, we tend to have you know, an introduction, and then we, we're building up to the climax, and usually the climax is right at the end. And then you've got that denouement, the resolution, right at the end. Well, in ancient texts, a lot of times the most important thing is right smack in the middle. They call this chiastic. It's, it comes from the Greek uh, letter uh, chi, which is, so a chiasm, kind of like an X. Um, that's what it looks like. It looks like our modern X. But anyway, something, when something's chiastic, the most important message is right in the middle of it. Well, right in the middle of Lamentations, we have this uh, wonderful verse that you are familiar with. And it goes like this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. 
His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We have a hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You know it. Well, anyways, again, how beautiful is that message? The rest of Lamentations is, is, is quite frankly depressing and dreary. Right in the middle there, though, right, chiastically, right in the smack middle, we've got that wonderful, Great is Thy Faithfulness, Your mercies, Lord, are new every single morning. All right, so trying to encourage you, all the Bible is great to read. Big books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, even little books, Lamentations. All right, Ezekiel, uh, written amidst uh, Babylonian cat captivity. Um, so again, the people are in exile. They're under the authority of the Babylonians. Um, there's this emphasis on the watchmen, which is kind of our... Uh, our foreshadowing of the office of the ministry later on. So the watchman, uh, God says, uh, so Ezekiel is the first watchman here. And he says, hey, your job is to warn the people. And if you don't warn the people, I'm coming after you. So it's your responsibility. Same with pastors. Pastors, your job is to give people my word, both the law and the gospel. If you don't warn them to repent of their sins, I'm coming after you. So if you're ever wondering why the pa pastors preach about repentance and about sin and about law, it's because it's their God-given duty and responsibility. Again, Ezekiel has this emphasis on the watchman. Some other cool stuff too. Beginning of Ezekiel, by the way, this bizarre vision that he sees uh, in, in ancient texts. Um, the Jewish uh, uh, rabbis uh, would say that, I think it was that that they that young men were not allowed to read it or, or were not supposed to read it until they were like age 30 because of how bizarre it is. Again, because they said, well, they're worried about a false interpretation. Remember how important biblical interpretation is. This is the whole point in the beginning of this lesson is that you have to have some ground rules. When you get these bizarre visions, you know, you put that in front of a 16, 17 year old kid, in the, in the case of today, they're gonna say, well, it must mean this, this, and this. And true story, uh, if you were to read my first Bible that I read when I was a teenager, when I read the book of Revelation, for example, which is very eerily similar to the visions that Ezekiel sees, I had all these crazy conclusions. Oh, this is talking about aliens. This is talking about spaceships. Because I didn't know how to read it. I didn't know how to interpret it. I had no grounds. I had no I had no fundamentals in reading. Okay? All right. Don't want to digress too much. Let's keep going. All right. Uh, we got Daniel. Daniel is written by the prophet Daniel. Um, it has apocalyptic tendencies, just like the book of Revelation. This is important. Might as well talk about it now. Apocalyptic literature is never intended to be taken literally. It is not written to be literal either. It is intentionally metaphorical. It's bizarre visions that have some symbolic uh, uh, things that are going on. And uh, the purpose of this is to kind of um, hide it from the, the, the governing authorities. So in the case of Revelation, Rome is in charge. And so when it's talking about the corruption of Rome, uh, Babylon, that's Revelation, uh, and that, that's the immediate context there, uh, it's intentionally done so, so that way the Christians won't be persecuted. So it's usually in the case of heavily persecution. Well, if you've read Daniel, a lot of persecution going on, right? Daniel's thrown in the lion's den because he refuses to bow his knee to the king. He says, "I will, you know, I'm only going to worship the one true God." So, apocalyptic literature is a genre, okay? It's a specific genre. It's just like we have fiction, not fiction, poetry, and you have to understand apocalyptic literature to properly understand what's going on in the book, so we can make a proper interpretation. We can do a more study on that at some point, but point here, I want to make clear at this point in the study is that we take literal what is intended to be literal. So authorial intent matters. If the author intends it to be taken figuratively, then we're going to take it figuratively. If the author intends it to, to, for it to be literal, we're going to take it literal. Classic point about what the author intends to be literal, when Jesus institutes a new covenant in his blood, it's a new covenant. Covenantal language is literal language. You don't speak in metaphors or figurative when you're talking about covenants. So we take it for what it is. Okay, Jesus, you says this is your body, this is your blood. I trust it to be true. Remember, reason, experience, feelings are the student. Scripture is the teacher. If reason, experience, or feelings contradict the Bible, I can't say the Bible must be interpreted in light of them. I must interpret my reason, experience, and feelings in light of the Bible. Make sense? Very important point. I, that's the most important thing I want you to know. Okay? So... Uh, who any, anyone who's doing an adult catechesis with me uh, through a video series because we can't do it person or face to face, I'm going to ask you, <clears throat> what's the what's the what's the teacher and what's the student? And you need to have an answer for that. The Bible is the teacher. My reason, my experience, my feelings are the student. Most important thing I want you to know from this class. So 34 minutes in, you didn't know. That's going to be going to be the question that I'm going to ask you. All right. I'm like all proud of myself right now because I remember to do that. 
not not trying to be like arrogantly haughty, but I'm just I, I forgot that I wanted to make sure I had a series of questions to make sure you were watching these videos. And I do not have this written down anywhere, so I'm so thankful I remembered because 34 minutes in, I do not want to start a video over again. Okay, focus. Game face. Let's go. All right, back to Daniel. <clears throat> written by the prophet Daniel, apocalyptic tendencies. God's power is greater than earthly powers. Think of the three men in the fiery furnace. Uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, they see the fourth person, which, by the way, is foretelling of Christ. Remember, I told you how Christ is the fulfillment, fulfillment of the scriptures. Uh, when they see that fourth angel there, uh, always historically understood to be the second person in the Trinity, the pre incarnate Christ. All right, let's get to the minor prophets. So, these next 12 books are the final 12 books of the Old Testament. I think there's 12, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yep, these are known as the minor prophets. There are ancient manuscripts that put all these prophets as one book because they're short. That's why they're called the minor prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, big books. Minor prophets. I mean, you could probably read the 12 minor prophets in the same amount of time it takes you to read Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Okay, Hosea. Uh, no mercy to the unfaithful. That's kind of this theme here. Um, Hosea marries a prostitute to demonstrate God's relationship with Israel. So it's this the reason is, is because a prostitute is unfaithful. Typically prostitutes, if they were, especially if they were married, they were being unfaithful to their husbands because they were sleeping with other people. So God tells Hosea, you're going to marry a prostitute. Just like, this is God speaking, just like my people have been unfaithful to me, you are going to be my earthly representative and you're going to marry someone who is unfaithful to show my people how they are being unfaithful. So God works through the prophet to bring about repentance. And that's the theme of the prophets all around. Lead them to repentance so that they can receive the forgiveness of sins that God freely offers. And of course, this has its fulfillment in Christ. In the Old Testament, it's a sacrificial system. Animals are slain, blood is shed. But all of that, it wasn't by faith in the blood of the animal that was shed. It was foretelling that people knew the Messiah is going to come. And the Messiah is going to bring us the forgiveness of sins. It has its fulfillment in Christ. All right, Joel. There's this imagery of destructive locusts as judgment because locusts destroy everything. That's how it's going to be in the judgment. And yet, the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit fulfilled at Pentecost. So Pentecost, the Old Testament reading, Joel, uh, that uh, there will be this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So you can see here that even when there's judgment, even when there's prophecies of doom, there's always included God's the, the hope of God's mercy. God's deliverance and God's salvation. That is always the theme in the prophets. There's no, even Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, right? Even in Jeremiah, there's always hope. There's always the promise of the gospel. You might have to read several chapters to get to it, but it's always going to be there. Let's keep going. Amos. Amos was a shepherd, later called to be a prophet, so his first vocation was he was a shepherd. Uh, God's law is seen as a plumb line. <clears throat> you know what a plumb line is? It, 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 uh, it marks a, oh, what's the word? Um, uh, you're you're like screaming at it through, screaming at me through the the camera here. Uh, flush is what I'm thinking, but that's not. Ah, uh, you know the word. Uh, either way, it's like setting the line in the sand. You know, one side is God pleasing, one side is not. Plumb line. It marks it, it marks right angles. Flush. Ah, you know it. All right, keep going. Uh, also, God, so God's line is the plumb line, but the remnant will live. Again, there's there's the gospel. Obadiah, shortest Old Testament book. The sin of pride, uh, insecurity, the day of the Lord drawing near. Uh, Jonah is the interesting. Uh, we everyone knows the story about uh, uh, Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three days, which is a true historical story. Again, reason, experience, feelings tell us it can't be true, but here's why. Especially we hold it to be true, because. Jonah is the only prophet whom Jesus likened himself to. Jesus never said, hey, I'm going to be like Isaiah or I'm, or I'm going to be like Jeremiah. He says, like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so also the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. Is that not Jesus teaching us how to read the Old Testament there? He's showing, hey, I'm the fulfillment of that. We talked about this already. Oh, I'm getting fired up. You can tell. I'm probably getting all red too. Uh, Jonah is sent to Nineveh to preach repentance. Nineveh, Gentiles. This is a wonderful illustration of God's uh, mercy towards Gentiles. For those of you who don't know, Gentile is any non-Jew, any non-Israelite. So Gentiles is the rest of the people of the world. So Jonah is sent to these people that aren't God's people. Uh, but it shows that God's grace is for everybody. His mercy is for everyone. He's going to send his son Jesus to die for everyone. 
Uh, again, God's mercy to Gentiles. Micah, warning against false prophets, nakedness, shame, foretelling of Christ coming from Bethlehem. Again, this emphasis on this remnant. Um, Nahum, the Lord described as an angry warrior. Uh, there's this destruction of Nineveh. So while Nineveh repents under Jonah, uh, there's this you know destruction of Nineveh because they they turn away. So they repent with Jonah, but nope. Sometimes and that's that, that's what happens. This is why you know to take an, an example today. Don't think for a second that because we're in the land of the free in the United States of America that we're safe. Uh, the only time we're safe is under God's grace. And if we refuse to repent, if we reject God, why would we not expect him to reject us? That's, and that's the warning of the prophets, and that's why they're still applicable to today. We learn from history's mistakes, lest we repeat them. Uh, Nahum, again, God's uh, word for his people. God's word is for his people. That's a wonderful reminder to us. The word is for you. You should read it every day as a Christian. So there's question number two. My expectation of a new member. I want you to read God's word every day, even if it's just for a minute or two. Okay? So first question was, is what's what's the teacher? You know, what's the student? Second question is, is what's my expectation for you with reading the Bible? Every day. That's the Christian expectation, that we would not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. That's the meaning of the third commandment. We'll get that uh, at a later at a later class. All right. Next, so that was the 40 minute mark. Question number two. God's word is for his people. That was under Nahum, because God's word is for you. Habakkuk, God permits evil to afflict his people. Uh, again, that's a wonderful thing to remind us of, that God does permit evil. And sometimes suffering happens to us. Um, we gotta have patience, have, have endurance on, in the midst of suffering. This is a theology of the cross, okay? Um, this does so even when we're suffering God did not forsake us. He did that to Jesus If you're suffering Rejoice in your suffering your reward is in heaven. Oh, it's so hard to do but faith trust God has a plan God's will is better than ours and he's gonna he'll, he'll be merciful to us and we'll get through it uh, The Lord supplies the patience so Habakkuk talks about the need for patience the Lord provides it the Lord's always providing and then Habakkuk 2 4 one of the it's basically the gospel in a nutshell of the Old Testament. The righteous shall live by his faith. And uh, Paul's going to talk about this in Justification of the New Testament. We'll get to that in a minute. Zephaniah, God's wrath against all nations, including his people. Day of the Lord. Once again, the remnant is preserved. You see this theme in the Minor Prophets. Haggai, rebuilding of the temple. The Lord blesses the people's focus on receiving the word. So the people say, hey, we want the word again. God blesses them for it. God will bless you too. Even if that doesn't look in the same kind of blessings as what we expect from the world, well, God will bless you. Even if that just means peace and comfort in the hope that is in you because of Christ Jesus. Zechariah, there's some bizarre visions of judgment. Uh, there's this branch prophecy of forgiveness. The temples are restored. The Lord will save his people. I have this verse here. They will look upon him whom they have pierced. It foretells Christ's death. Zechariah is also where we uh, have this prophecy that Jesus or that it doesn't say Jesus. It doesn't say Jesus. Je the name Jesus. Well, I'm just going to say it. The name Jesus does not appear in the Old Testament. Yes, it's Yeshua in Hebrew. I know that. So don't say, "Hey, he's wrong." I mean, like actually, Jesus, as in, like the Jesus of the New Testament, is not mentioned by name in the Old Testament. The Messiah is. Messiah, Meshiach is the Hebrew word for what the Greek is Christ. Messiah and Christ. Messiah is Hebrew. Christ is Greek. Yes, prophecy of Messiah. But anyways, this prophecy of uh, he will come riding in on a donkey. We hear this every year on Palm Sunday and on Advent 1. Uh, Christ fulfills this when he rides in a donkey uh, at the, the do in front of the daughters of, uh, of Zion. Uh, behold, your king, uh, your king is coming. Oh, I can't remember the prophecy uh, in Zechariah. I'm going to look it up real quick. Got it. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's Zechariah. Uh, again, fulfilled on uh, when Christ has his triumphal entry. We'll talk about that in a little bit too. Leading up to his death. Remember, that's the first Palm Sunday. All right, we'll talk about that in a future video when we talk about the theology of worship. Hopefully, we'll talk about the church here. Hopefully, I remember to do that. Last book of the Old Testament, we have the book of Malachi. Condemnation of unfaithful priests. Talks about divorce, unfaithfulness. But yet, it also talks about the Lord's faithfulness and the love for Israel. Malachi is a wonderful bridge to the New Testament because it has in here the foretelling of John the Baptist as the one who will prepare the way before the Messiah. So again, it's a great bookend. 
ends the Old Testament, bridges the gap to how the New Testament will begin with uh, John the Baptist foretelling of the Messiah who was to come. Before we get to the New Testament, though, I just wanted to have a brief introduction on the Apocrypha. If you wanted to take a break here, 45 minute mark, this is probably going to be a long video. Feel free to stop it, pick it up later. Otherwise, let's keep on going. All right. And then the Apocrypha, again, this is not canonical scripture, but in case you hear about these books, it's important to know a little bit about them. I'm not going to say much other than what I got written here. Judith uh, Luther referred to it as beautiful religious fiction. Describes how the Lord delivered Israel through the self-sacrifice of a widow, Judith. Again, just interesting stuff to read. Wisdom of Solomon teaches rulers the contrast between wisdom and folly, a lot like Proverbs, hence Wisdom of Solomon, very similar name, Proverbs written by Solomon. Um, uh, it has, though, Hellenistic ideals, uh, Stoicism, uh, Platonism, which is why um, the early church understood that this wasn't actually written by Solomon, because it had too much Stoicism and Platonism, which Solomon wouldn't have had that uh, in his in his life and we see this in his book of proverbs that that wasn't there so that's one of the reasons why it was rejected as a, as a canonical book uh, tobit describes the affliction and mercy of god while encouraging israelites to practice righteousness and almsgiving so basically it's just you know a work a, a book about uh, doing doing good works ecclesiasticus also known as sirach uh, instructs people in wisdom much like proverbs did baruch uh, named after a servant of Jeremiah, calls people to repentance, urges them to pray for their rulers. A uh, letter of Jeremiah warns of exile and pending temptations of idolatry. Of all the books here that I would encourage you to read, here's the next one, First and Second Maccabees. While it is not canonical, um, these are works of history, and we don't, we shouldn't have any reason to doubt that they actually happened. Again, it kind of, it kind of, what Maccabees does is ex explains the history in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and really gives you an idea of why the Jews hate the Romans so much. That alone is worth reading First and Second Maccabees. Susanna, uh, dangers and virtues of public justice amongst God's people, and then we have this final book here. Bell and the Dragon shows the God of Daniel is great and there is no God besides him. <clears throat> instructs on use of wisdom and reason. So remember, reason is not a bad thing here. Uh, it just has to be put in its proper place. So no one's telling you throw away your reason. It says, let your reason be subordinate to God's word. All right, let's jump into the New Testament books. We've got 27 of them, once again, written in Greek. <clears throat> Matthew, wonderful bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It has a very Old Testament-like structure. It quotes the Old Testament more than any of the other Gospels. Um, it really shows that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, um, even though it doesn't have that John 5 through 9 verse that I cited at the beginning where Jesus says, Search the scriptures, for them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Matthew doesn't say that, but he just shows in his book that Christ fulfills it all. Uh, Mark, uh, this is the shortest of the four Gospels. Um, I call it the gospel brochure. So just like a brochure kind of gives you the, the short version, Mark kind of gives us an abbreviated uh, version uh, version of the gospel story. Um, theologians like to call it the gospel of immediacy because in the book of Mark, he uses the word, and then immediately, Jesus. so Jesus is baptized. Immediately, the Holy Spirit leads him out into the wilderness. So the word immediately kind of keeps you, keeps you on your toes. It keeps you going, keeps you reading. It kind of, it's, Mark gives you the impression that he wants you to read it all right now. Don't put the book down kind of thing. Um, Luke, uh, I call this the parable gospel because there are more parables in Luke than in the, any of the other four gospels. Um, right in the beginning, the, the writer kind of shows his education. And, and Luke, by the way, was a doctor. And he says that he is going to give a full and orderly account of, uh, that's exactly what he says. And so you can tell he does his research. I mean, he interviews the eyewitnesses. He, he, he records uh, that which, the, because Luke wasn't, you know, a gospel, uh, Luke wasn't an apostle himself. Um, but Luke has an association with Paul. We learn about that in Acts. Um, but yeah. Wait, did I say that right? Yeah, because Mark's with Peter. Because Mark wasn't an apostle either. But Mark, Mark and Peter work together, and I think it's Luke and Paul. Hope I'm right. I'm too late to stop. So you can correct me if I'm wrong. All right. Next, we've got John. <clears throat> now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. Okay, synopsis means to, um, well, optic means to see. And S-Y-N is a prefix meaning together. So to see together. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke see the story kind of the same way. So they tell the story the same way. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are chronological in their telling of <coughs> the gospel narrative. 
John, however, totally theological. Time is not uh, chronological in the way he tells a story. Time is, so Greek has kind of two concepts of time, chronos, where we get the word chronology from, and kairos, kind of God's working in time. So John is much more of the kairos time, where he shows that when God works through Jesus, here's its greater fulfillment. So in John chapter 6, for example, he tells the feeding of the 5,000. I'm telling this story because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all those three Gospels tell about the feeding of the 5,000. Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they just they put it in the timeline of Jesus' life, one of his miracles. John shows how it's sacramental in nature. And <clears throat> when you read it, you can't help but hear, oh, he's talking about the Lord's Supper. So John's point is, is when Jesus feeds the 5,000, as that was a miracle, so we also have this miracle of the Lord's Supper, where Jesus gives us his body and blood uh, under the bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins. We'll talk more about that. We'll talk more about the Lord's Supper at a later video. But either way, John is, again, theological. Um, he, he, is, he, do, he doesn't actually give us the historical account of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. John gives us kind of a theological summary of what Jesus does throughout his life and shows us how it has its fulfillment in the Lord's Supper. Again, that's what theological means. It's kind of a study of, how, of who God is and how he works through history to accomplish his salvation for his people. All right, um, I'll read here from John, written nearly a, a generation after the first three Gospels, which again are known as the Synoptics. John's Gospel is much more reflective on the meaning of Jesus' teaching. Again, that's the important point there. Acts. This book concerns the life of the early Christian church with stories of the acts and doings of the apostles themselves. So Acts begins with Jesus ascending into heaven, more or less. And then we've got the day of Pentecost. And then we've got, boom, the birth of the Christian church, which is the day of Pentecost. It's the birth of the Christian church. And you've got all the happenings and doings of the apostles. Romans. Now we're going to get into the letters, also known as epistles, because epistole is just the Greek word for letter. Uh, Romans is written by the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to the church in Rome. It's the doctrine epistle, as I like to call it. It details sin, justification, election, sanctification. We'll talk all about this in future videos. Just know Romans, very heavy doctrinally. 1 Corinthians, again, written by Paul. He writes to the church in Corinth. He teaches about church division, sexual immorality, marriage in chapter 7, doctrine of the Lord's Supper, chapters 10 and 11. Uh, which is also, we're going to talk, he'll talk a little about closed communion. We'll get that at a later uh, later time when we talk about the Lord's Supper. And also, the most famous chapter on the resurrection, chapter 15, talks about the bodily resurrection. Second Corinthians, by Paul to the church in Corinth, once again, emphasis on the comfort of the gospel. The word comfort is repeated a bunch of times. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, the ministry of reconciliation, encouragement to give generously and cheerfully, the dangers of false apostles. Galatians, also by Paul, to the churches in the province of Galatia. So whereas Corinth is a city, Rome's a city, Galatia is a province. It's like modern day Turkey. Um, in Galatians, we learn uh, that there is only one gospel, no other. So he says, even if an angel were to come and proclaim a gospel different than the one you have been taught, let him be cursed. Anathema is what is what Paul says in Greek. In Greek, so again, there's only one true gospel. This is remember we talked about false doctrine. This is the need for the canon, why that arose. All right, um, Paul has an emphasis in Galatians on justification by faith, not by works of the law. He makes a distinction between the law and the promise. We talked about that as a hermeneutical principle already. He makes use of the Old Testament. He defines freedom uh, in the Christian context what freedom means. And freedom, by the way, is not to do whatever we want. Instead, what it means is we're free from the coercion of the law. Now we're free to serve our neighbors. So freedom denotes a responsibility to serve because we don't have to be worried about, about fixing ourselves or redeeming ourselves by the law. Christ has done that for us. So now that we have this freedom of Christ delivering us from our sins, now we have the time to go and, and then the joy to go serve our neighbors so that they can have that joy and comfort too. Uh, and then he ends kind of with uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians. Uh, this is by Paul, and this is to the church in Ephesus. Uh, Paul teaches the importance of unity in the church, and this is a gift from God. So when we strive for unity, unity of faith can only come by God's grace, because faith can only come uh, faith can only come by God's grace. Ephesians 2:9. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Um, da, 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 uh, 
unity is not created by man. Importance of grace by faith, not by works. I just said that verse. And then uh, it also includes the importance of doing good works. So it doesn't mean that we don't have to do good works. No, we still need to do good works. They're just not for salvation. Ephesians 2.10, so that we may do the good works that God has created for us in Christ Jesus to do. Uh, and then Ephesians 5, I kind of already talked about this when I talked about Hosea. No, Song of Solomon, when I talked about the love poem uh, between husband and wife. Well, Ephesians 5, that's our great book and chapter on Christian marriage and what that looks like, that wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should love their wives as Christ loves the church. All right, let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to Philippians. This is by Paul to the church in Philippi. It's a pretty short epistle. Um, he's got this great verse in Philippians 1.21 where he says, To live is Christ and to die is gain. Um, he talks about the humility of Christ in his incarnation, that he empties himself. He not, he not uh, deem equality with God a thing to be grasped. It doesn't mean that when God becomes man in the person of Jesus, that Jesus is, is not equal to God with respect to his divinity, but he is less than him with respect to his humanity. We learn about that in the Athanasian Creed. Uh, there's righteousness through faith, uh, straining ahead toward the goal of salvation. He offers this encouragement with joy. Philippians is, uh, my grandpa used to teach, my grandpa, he's now in heaven, but he was my pastor and he used to teach that Philippians um, was the epistle of joy. That was what he always called it. It was, it was his favorite epistle. And so I, I like it because of him. And that shows us, by the way, the importance of having faithful parents and grandparents uh, that, who teach us these wonderful, encouraging things about the scripture. Let's talk about Colossians here for a second. Uh, Paul is writing this one too to the church in Colossae. Um, it teaches the superiority of Christ in opposition to the wisdom and teachings of this world. We are alive in Christ by the circumcision of Christ, which kind of has its fulfillment. What that means, that's a reference to baptism. So just as people were uh, circumcised, boys were circumcised on the eighth day, um, which was kind of a, this idea of this new creation. The eighth day is always this new creation idea. So also baptism uh, is a new creation in Christ Jesus. We'll learn more about this in a future video as well. Colossians is a great book. Um, very, very detailed. Uh, it can be a little tricky to read, um, but you should still read it because God's word is good. Let's talk about the Thessalonian letters, First and Second Thessalonians. This both are written to the church in Thessalonica. In First Thessalonians, Paul writes concerning the second coming of Christ, the day of the Lord, encourages the people to rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Interesting little fun fact. Everyone knows that in English, the shortest Bible verse is uh, Jesus wept, <clears throat> while in Greek, which is the original language of the New Testament, uh, the shortest verse is rejoice always. Beautiful. And that's in First Thessalonians. But again, he also tells us to pray without ceasing. So we should do everything in prayer. Second Thessalonians, Paul writes concerning the judgment at Christ's second coming, warns against the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, he warns against being lazy and idle. So the problem was is people thought, well, Christ is coming again, so I'm not going to do my job. I'm just going to sit around and wait for him to come back. By the way, cults do this even today. They should be reading Second Thessalonians. So whatever vocations we have to do, Luther is famous for saying, uh, what if you knew the Lord was coming back tomorrow? He said, I'd plant an apple tree today. His point being, I'm going to live today as if tomorrow is going to happen and the next is going to happen. And I'm just going to keep doing my duty that God has given me to do until that last trumpet sounds. Uh, at the end of 2 Thessalonians, he, he gives this wonderful exhortation to stand firm in the faith, despite uh, the adversaries and, and the wicked and evil of this world that comes at us. All right, the next two uh, letters, we're going to kind of talk about them together. First and Second Timothy, they are two separate letters, but Paul is writing to a young pastor named Timothy. And these are known as the pastoral epistles, along with Titus, which we'll talk about next. So Paul encourages Timothy not only to be a faithful pastor, but also addresses some doctrinal concerns of the church, uh, such as prayer for all people. He, he talks about women in the church, women's role in the church. Um, so we do not uh, permit women's ordination because of passages like those in 1 Timothy 2, where it says, I do not permit a woman to have authority over a man or to teach. Um, which the pastoral office would and assumes both having authority over others. Um, now we are under authority of Christ, but we have authority over the sheep that Christ has called us to preach and teach the word of God to and to administer the sacraments. Uh, and then it talks about qualifications of pastors and deacons. First Timothy three. I did my whole sacred theology masters. This is a postgraduate uh, degree after. Um, 
I graduated from seminary with my MDiv, and my whole thing was on the pastoral epistles. I'm very passionate about them, but it gives direction on what is required of a pastor and what a pastor must do in his office. Next, Titus, again, the third pastoral epistle. Here, Paul's writing to a young pastor named Titus. Paul, once again, lists qualifications of a pastor. He exhorts Titus to teach sound doctrine. By the, word, by the way, the word sound in Greek is hygienist. That's where we get the word hygiene from. So sound doctrine is hygienist doctrine, healthy doctrine. So good doctrine is healthy for us. Bad doctrine is unhealthy for us. We understand those terms of healthy. If we could only apply how we understand daily bodily health in spiritual terms like the scriptures teach, we would be much more careful about having pure, healthy, hygienist doctrine. Um, let's go on to Philemon. Very short book, <clears throat> written by Paul. Interesting letter. Super fascinating. He writes it to a slave owner named Philemon regarding, so Philemon is actually a slave owner, uh, and he is writing on behalf of a slave named Onesimus. So the slave's name is Onesimus. Paul is writing on his behalf, <clears throat> and he essentially functions as a small c Christ. He basically, you know, uh, my, my, what I mean by that is Paul functions as a, as a Christ-like figure on behalf of Onesimus, pleading for Philemon, uh, pleading for Onesimus to Philemon to essentially say what Christ has done. So Christ has given up his life for us, so Paul is kind of saying, hey, uh, on behalf of Christ, you know, cut this guy a break. Uh, next we have Hebrews. <clears throat> now the author is disputed. I personally think Paul wrote it. I have no reason to doubt that Paul wrote it. People don't like it. It's a disputed book, as I told you, because that early canon, the Muratorian canon, we talked about this at the beginning, that said Hebrews wasn't in the in that first list. You can read more about that. Some people say Barnabas. I have no problem with it being Paul. I also have no problem with it being the author disputed. Why? Because the book itself doesn't say who wrote it. So for that, that's why it doesn't matter to me. It's in our canon. It's good. It's an awesome book. A lot of people struggle with understanding it. Why? The only reason they, they don't they have a problem understanding it is because they don't know their Old Testament. Hebrews, more than any other book in the New Testament, demonstrates how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies and how Jesus is the center, the key to understanding both Testaments. We talked about this at hermene the, the hermeneutical discussion at the onset. Man, if you want to see, if you want to learn, without reading any other book, if you want to learn how to read the Bible, start with Hebrews. And I'm dead serious about this. Hebrews will teach you how to read the Bible. Now, you might have to ask some questions along the way, but man, tough stuff, but awesome stuff. James, this is a book written by the half-brother of Jesus. Now, we can talk about what half-brother means. It's a long, whole other discussion. Uh, but either way, half-brother of Jesus. Um, he uh, emphasizes the importance of works in the Christian life. So this is a book about sanctification. It is also uh, kind of wisdom literature, like Proverbs is in the Old Testament. There's, there's short sayings, uh, like short little Proverbs that give us wisdom. So Luther is famously known for writing that James is the epistle of straw. He shows greater appreciation for it later in life, but he's famous for saying this. Well, the reason being is because he's living in a time when the gospel had been completely lost. He doesn't like James because James has hardly any gospel in it, whereas Paul's letters are just full of the gospel, what God does for us. James, though, is, is more about law. It's about how we should live as Christians. Well, as Christians, we need to care about this because we do have good works that we have been given to do. Uh, so James, great book. James is actually what I wrote my MDiv thesis on to graduate from seminary. And uh, I wrote, I, my whole thing was on the faith and works section of chapter 2. And I love it and passionate about it. And I truly believe that, G, that Paul or James is teaching justification by faith uh, in, in that chapter. And his point, though, is that it doesn't stop there for the Christian. I mean, yes, justification by faith is how we get to heaven. But, man, we got so much stuff to do. Faith without works is dead. Let's go on. Let's do something. Right? If I tell my wife I love her, but I never kiss her, I never smile at her, and I don't talk to her, I don't love her. Come on, let's be real. Well, if I'm justified by faith, that doesn't mean I sit on my hands, I don't do anything, I don't go to church, I don't honor my parents, and I kill people. Pfft. Obviously, you don't actually believe you've been justified. Right? That's the whole point on that faith and work section. We've been justified by faith. So in James chapter 2, he says, Abraham believed in God, and God credits him as righteousness, and he will be called a friend of God. And then 
it's chiastic. We talked about chias chiasm already. The middle section, right in the middle there, and the rest of it is all about, okay, now you've been justified by faith. Here's now what you can go do. Go out and do the works God has given you to do. So James is basically telling the early Christians, don't be lazy. Be good Christians. Show the love of Christ to others. Okay, first Peter. Written by the Apostle Peter. He writes to the believers who are in exile. So these are to all people scattered uh, throughout. The word actually in Greek is diaspora. You may have heard that word before. Uh, emphasis on Christ being the living stone. Um, exhortation to submit to authority. Um, he talks about the suffering that a Christian will face. Interesting thing in 1 Peter, he says that suffering is, is, gra is grace. Did I say that already? Oh, I said face. Grace rhymes with face. So uh, when Christians encounter suffering, he's saying this is a gracious thing, that God is working this to get you to trust him. And that's how ultimately how Christians view suffering, is no matter what befalls us, um, the Lord permits evil in order to draw us closer to him, to trust him to trust in his mercy and to trust in his goodness. And lastly, Peter kind of ends with uh, shepherding God's flock, and that's kind of a, an address to pastors about shepherding uh, the people. Don't lord it over them. Um, so don't be, a, don't be a lord over the people. Be a shepherd. Care for God's sheep. Second Peter um, is written to all believers. So as the, the first letter is written to believers in exile, Second Peter written to everybody, uh, warns of false teachers, emphasizes the day of the Lord, kind of end times stuff. Um, again, this, this, there's always a warning of, of, of false teachers throughout the scriptures. First, the second, third John, all three letters are written by the Apostle John. They're all pretty short. First John's the longest, second, third John, super short. Um, uses family relationships as, uh, as a way of describing church relationships, um, which is a beautiful thing because we are a family in Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. You've heard this language before. Um, speaks of walking in the light, walking in the truth. So the Christian uh, walks, you know, uh, my word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. We get that from the Psalms. But John has this emphasis on Christians walking in that light, walking in the truth. Uh, he warns of antichrists, plural, because an antichrist is anyone who is opposed to Christ. So anything, literally anything, that is opposed to Jesus or the truth of God's word is antichrist. And that's an article of faith. That's hard for us to trust that today. Again, even a person who espouses the name Christian, even a church that espouses the name Christian, but they preach or teach something that is opposed to the word of God. Remember what Paul says in Galatians? We talked about this already. Let him be anathema. They're cursed. That is antichrist. Um, first, second, third John, last comment on that. It encourages us to acknowledge our sin, but also to love each other. So I think it's 1 John, he says, if anyone says that he has no sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. So we should never deny that we are poor, miserable sinners, always in the need of the forgiveness of sins. The book of Jude, probably the least known book in the New Testament. So think of Leviticus in the Old Testament, like no one reads it and understands it, knows about it. Jude seems to be that way in the New Testament. I don't know why, but no one ever wants to talk about Jude. Um, written by Jude, uh, tradition, naming him a half-brother of Jesus, just like James. Again, the book itself doesn't make this claim. But he warns of false teachers being a constant threat to the health of the church. Wonderful warning for us to, to heed. Um, he gives us encouragement to persevere. Jude, very similar to Second Peter, which is why uh, typically a lot of times there were issues, in, in the, not issues, there were examples in the early church of Second Peter and Jude uh, being... Um, Oh, I can't think of the word now. They were they were they were not holistically received like Paul's letters in the Gospels. There's a word for that. There's some manuscript evidence that like Jude and Second Peter weren't in canon lists. That's 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 my only point. Nothing you need to be concerned about. It's in the Bible. It's not going anywhere, and it's a good book to read. Check it out. Finally, Revelation, written by the Apostle John himself after he was exiled. This is an apocalyptic work. I already talked about this when I talked about Daniel and uh, Zechariah, I think. I think mostly just Daniel, though. Yeah, mostly just Daniel. I already talked about that. Go back and listen to the section on Daniel if you want to learn more about apocalyptic literature. Um, Revelation uses heavy imagery and metaphors to convey realities of current life in a codified fashion. I already explained it once again. But again, to properly understand uh, that, those bizarre images, um, go back and listen to... 
what I talked about at Daniel, or get a commentary, um, a, hel a helpful commentary that will, that will help explain those things to you. Um, because again, the book of Revelation, it's intended to be figurative. And so when the author intends something to be figurative, we must take it figurative. When the author intends something to be literal, we must take it literal. And the context will help you determine that. Okay? So, so because someone might say, well, the author doesn't say, take this figuratively or take this literally. That's not what I, I mean to say. What I mean is the context will tell you. So if I tell my kid, um, if I tell my kids, do not put your hands on the stove. You're going to get burned. They know that means dad's being literal here. Okay? No kid ever says, oh, he's just speaking figuratively. Psst, right? I mean, burn hand, obviously. Same thing with the scriptures. It just takes careful reading. Context determines it. Well, hey, uh, I know this is a long uh, introduction here, but I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, again, um, I hope you listened to the video. There were two big questions that I had for you uh, here uh, throughout the video. So that's anyone who's doing adult catechesis with me. I'm going to want to know uh, those answers from you. And uh, thanks for watching. And we'll pick up with our next video uh, next time. And we will be talking about uh, the... Tr uh, Oh my goodness, what is it? Tradition. Um, history of the church. History of the church, role of tradition. And we're just going to kind of give the whole big picture of, of where the Lutheran church comes from historically. And also get you excited to read a little bit about uh, church history. And then the third video. Now that may be broken into two videos, by the way. I haven't done it yet, so I don't know. And then we'll talk about law and gospel. And then we're going to get into some doctrinal stuff. The Lord be with you. And I look forward to, to meeting with you and discussing this video soon.